So we heard earlier today from, um, from a number of established scholars and now, at this point in the day, we're going to turn, from hearing from, turn to hearing from some emerging scholars, three graduate students. Um, and this uh, was inspired by an experience I had at a recent conference where all of the most exciting papers I heard were from graduate students. Um, and I thought, gee, it's so great to see new ideas, <laughs> fresh research, just as it's being done. So, uh, so I did a call for papers, and these are the, the papers that my colleagues on the board of the Spain North Africa project and I selected. Um, and you will hear more about what they're all going to be talking about, but they treat the same sort of big questions that we've been talking about. And they will be shorter papers, about 20 minutes each. Um, and you'll have a chance to ask these uh, graduate students questions at the end of their little panel. And then um, I'll invite everybody who gave a paper to come up and join them at this table and we'll have some time for more concluding discussion. I know we were having, there were probably many questions that didn't actually get, get asked um, uh, at the end of at that last uh, discussion session. So we will, we will have more time and then we'll have a reception where you can continue asking each other questions <laughs> and discussing. Um, so I want to now introduce um, Linda Gale Jones, who is going to chair this session. Linda is my fellow board member of the Spain North Africa Project, and she was present at the inception of the Spain North Africa Project, though in a slightly different capacity than, than Camilo and I were um, as participants in this NEH Summer Institute. She was one of the faculty who presented to us um, at the NEH Summer Institute. <coughs> She is Ramon y Cajal professor, Research Professor at Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona um, in the Department of the Humanities. She has a PhD in religion from UC Santa Barbara. And she focuses on religion and culture in Al-Andalus and the Maghreb, especially in the Almohad and Nusrid periods. Um, she has a wonderful book that came out with um, Cambridge University Press in 2012 called Power of Oratory in the Medieval Muslim World, um, and also works on questions of gender and masculinity in the Islam medieval Islamic world. So uh, please join me in welcoming Linda, who will introduce each of the speakers. Thank you very much, Abby, for that uh, introduction. And just to say how happy I am to be here and to have, uh, it's been such a pleasure to listen to the papers of this morning and this uh, early afternoon. So now we're going to turn, as, um, as Abigail said, to uh, three papers by um, uh, emerging scholars. So the first paper will be by uh, Umberto Bongianino. I hope I've said your name correctly, right? And, sorry, you're a, uh, he's a PhD student in Islamic art and archaeology at the University of Oxford, and he's uh, literally just finishing up his work now. Uh, his research interests revolve around the material culture of the Islamic dynasties that ruled across the medieval Mediterranean from the 7th to the 14th centuries, and uh, in specific, his uh, Richard, uh, he's been reaching, uh, researching the origin and development of Maghrebi cursive scripts, uh, looking at, um, well, in an attempt to understand better the role played by ideological, social, <laughs> aesthetic, and economic factors that have influenced the style and practices of the copyists. And uh, we're going to see how he develops those ideas uh, in his paper which is titled The Ideological Power of Some Almohad Illuminated Manuscripts. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Abigail, for uh, having allowed me to take part in this very stimulating symposium. Now, Yes. As um, some of you may already know, <laughs> my doctorate research focuses on the paleography of early Arabic manuscripts from Al-Andalus and the Maghreb Al-Aqsa, and more broadly on the so-called um, arts of the book flourished in this part of the Islamic world between uh, the 10th and the 13th centuries. 
My arguments are principally based on the data that I have gathered from roughly 160 dated manuscripts and documents written uh, in Maghrebi scripts, among which feature prominently those produced under the Almohads from the mid 12th century onwards. With regard to the illuminated manuscripts of the Almohad period, especially those more directly associated with the patronage of the ruling elites, I have been able to observe a number of interesting and innovative features, both stylistic and technical, which constitute the subject of my talk today. The emergence and political success of the Almohad movement in the second quarter of the 12th century represented for the Islamic West a moment of strong discontinuity with the past, especially because of the heterodox doctrinal stances and approach to legal practices adopted by the new Berber rulers and their uh, ulama. The Almohad's veneration for their founder and spiritual leader, Ibn Tumart, the Mahdi, and their fierce opposition to the Maliki school of jurisprudence, deeply rooted in Al-Andalus and in the Maghreb, caused a profound fracture within Maghrebi society, uh, perhaps comparable to uh, the Fatimid conquest of Sunni Egypt uh, 300 years earlier. This drastic deviation from the strict adherence to Maliki juridical practices professed by the Almohad's predecessors, the Almoravids, was only redressed in the mid-13th century with the return to orthodoxy promoted by the Marinids in the Maghrib al-Aqsa and the Banu Nas in Granada. The hallmarks of Almohad Mahdism, as well as the reflection of their innovative theological and philosophical stances, have been searched for extensively in the architecture and visual culture of the medieval Maghreb although without much success. Attempts have been made to pinpoint the aesthetic principles, the stylistic repertoire, the techniques and materials which make a mosque, a minaret, a minbar, a textile distinctly Almohad because of the ideological content. And this is an approach which uh, is pro problematic to say the least. As exemplified by Amira Benison's recent book on the Almoravid and Almohad empires, the trend among today's leading scholars is in fact to avoid discussing Almohad material culture in the light of doctrinal ideology and vice versa. What is it stressed instead is the continuity from the, Almohad, uh, from the Almoravid period, the evolutionary rather than revolutionary nature of stylistic changes, the reliance upon existing workforce with their specific experience, techniques, and repertoire, and so forth. While this approach is certainly sounder and more fruitful than the other one, I would like to argue that there is a particular group of artifacts, namely illuminated manuscripts, in which the Almohad ideology was conveyed also through technical and stylistic elements. And these, I believe, it's because certain books, uh, such as the works of Ibn Tumart, were the ultimate conveyors of Almohad doctrine, as opposed to epigraphic texts on monuments and other media, where the ideological messages were understandably limited by a series of functional aspects, or simply absent. Now, what do we know about illuminated manuscripts produced in Al-Andalus and the Maghreb before the rise of the Almohads? Absolutely nothing is the honest answer if we consider the Umayyad and Amirid period. With the exception of Quranic manuscripts, mostly fragments, the earliest surviving examples of illuminated books date from between the Taifa period and the Almoravid conquest, such as this one, which is uh, a luxury copy of Malik's uh, Muatta, which is the fundamental text of Maliki's school. While in the 11th century most secular manuscripts were already being copied on paper, parchment was still considered the only acceptable support for important religious books such as this one. The illuminated motifs and devices typical of Quranic illumination, uh, the use of chrysography, that is writing in gold, and the chapter headings in archiving angular scripts, they are all stylistic elements attesting to the veneration for the Imam Malik and his work intrinsic in, in the religious milieu of medieval Al-Andalus. 
The fact that the founder of the Maliki school had condemned the practice of Quranic illumination on the grounds that it could distract the reader does not seem to have prevented the Andalusis from decorating with gold headings and polychrome designs the margins of both their Qurans and the works of Malik himself. The script used for the main text is, uh, as one would expect, a standard uh, Andalusi book hand, enhanced with some calligraphic features. The second Almoravid ruler, Ali ibn Yusuf ibn Tashfin, was not only a powerful military reader, leader uh, who completed the conquest of Al-Andalus started by his father, but also a very cultivated man. In the newly founded capital of Marrakesh, he had a splendid Kitab al-Muwatta, copied for his uh, Khizana, his private library, numerous volumes of which have survived, um, and here you can see uh, one which is in the Karawin library in Fez. The title page of this juz includes, uh, rather unusually, uh, the name of the master calligraphy, um, Yahya ibn Muhammad uh, ibn Abd al Abad al Lahmi, um, who was the son of the last petty king of Seville and Cordova al Mu'tamid, exiled to North Africa after the Almoravid conquest of the Guadalquivir Valley. Ali ibn Yusuf, a decision to employ an Andalusi prince as a personal copist, can be read uh, as an eloquent and skillful act of symbolic appropriation. The importation of Andalusi scripts into the Maghrib al Aqsa under the new Berber dynasty thus became an instrument of Almoravid ideology, and in this particular case also of religious piety and full endorsement of the Maliki school. Towards the end of the Almoravid period, we can observe the timid appearance of a new calligraphic script, uh, very different from the standard Andalusi uh, book hands, which is curvilinear but not round, employed in the chapter headings and frontispieces of a couple of illuminated manuscripts, such as this Hadith manuscript in the uh, Escorial library. You can see it here. But also, in architectural decoration and wood inlay, such as in the minbar of the Karawin Mosque, dated 1144 AD, which is the last major testimony of Almoravid patronage before the Almohad takeover. This style, called by modern Moroccan scholars Thuluth Maghribi, is clearly derived from Eastern calligraphic models, especially Egyptian and Ifriki, and is therefore also called Mashriki Mutamahrab, meaning Maghribized Mashriki. However, because of its <laughs> lack of fixed proportions and its free and often convoluted ductus, it can hardly be mistaken for any Eastern calligraphic style. It is, in fact, a purely Maghribi reinterpretation of Eastern Thuluth and Diwani scripts. The absolute prominence that this new curvilinear style acquired during the Almohad period will be discussed in a minute. Before, I just wanted to show you one last parchment copy of Malik's Muatta from the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, which was penned in a beautiful Andalusi book hand and provided with an extended marginal commentary in the Great Mosque of Granada in the year 1148 AD, which is uh, the last year, uh, year of uh, Al Almoravid domination in the city. This is the last dated Muwatta I have been able to trace before a gap of almost 80 years, roughly coinciding with the heyday of the Almohad rule in the Maghreb, a period uh, which the sources describe as characterized by anti-Maliki sentiments and measures. Under the new Berber dynasties, books such as this uh, were uh, replaced by uh, those of Ibn Tumat and forbidden and even burned publicly. Now, uh, the illuminated manuscripts I'm about to show you were all copied during the golden age of the Almoha Caliphate, namely the reign of Abd al-Mu'min, his son Abu Yaqub Yusuf, and his uh, grandson Abu Yusuf al-Mansur. What was the actual impact of the Almohad revolution on manuscript culture on both sides of the Strait of Gibraltar? First, as I have already mentioned, the new regime enforced a drastic opposition to the transmission of Maliki fiqh commentaries, 
which had been the pillars of the Almoravid interpretation and application of the Sharia. The reign of uh, Yaqub al-Mansur especially has gone down in the annals as a phase during which Almohad religious principles were uh, imposed more aggressively than ever. And the circulation and study of Maliki juri juridical commentaries was directly challenged. In a strenuous effort to inculcate the Almohad, source-based approach to law in place of the commentary-based uh, one of the Maliki uh, school, Al-Mansur openly denounced Maliki stances and over-speculative approaches and ordered Maliki commentary works to be collected and publicly burned across the empire. These books had to be replaced with the works of the Mahdi, whose copy and diffusion was promoted actively by the first Almohad caliphs through decrees which imposed their study among the ulama. What's more, as pointed out by Amira Benison, the Almohad caliphs were actively engaged in teaching and promoting Almohad Islam, determining the law and overseeing the moral lives of their subjects. Unlike their Almo Almoravid predecessors, who for every single action undertaken had to rely on the pronouncement of a throng of Maliki Fukaha. The didactic role of the caliph is evident from the Isnad prominently featured at the beginning of Ibn Tumar's work, where Abd al-Mu'min, uh, who is the first Almohad caliph, is presented as the chief transmitter of the Mahdi uh, and the Mahdi's teachings. But the sources also portray the Almohad rulers as collectors of hadith and indefatigable patrons of scholars and copists involved in this activity. Now, concerning the stylistic aspects of Almohad illuminated manuscripts, what needs to be stressed is that they represent and indeed proclaim the complete assimilation of Andalusi calligraphic styles and scribal practices as a way, I believe, of making the Almohad doctrine palatable to the Andalusi elites and portray the new rulers less as Berber fanatics and barbarians and more as cultivated revivers of religious belief, a name that the Almoravids before them never really achieved. The finest Andalusi calligraphers and scribes were invited to settle down in Marrakesh, Fez, Ceuta, Rabat, and to contribute to the flourish of the arts of the book in the Maghreb. Also, the already mentioned Maghrebi Thuluth script was appropriated by the Almohads and officialized as a true dynastic brand, not only on manuscripts, but also on other media, including coinage, as we shall see in a minute. Another important revolution in manuscript culture was the introduction of paper as a support, not only for chancery documents and the, man uh, the manuscripts of Ibn Tumar's works, but also for multi-volume royal Quranic codices. This was made possible by the notable, noticeable rise in the number of paper mills in Seville, Fes, uh, Marrakesh, and by the achievement of a higher quality standard of the paper itself. However, I believe <coughs> that this phenomenon also had an ideological motive behind it. Namely, the Almohad's rejection of hyper-normative approaches to practical matters, which had until then prevented paper from being employed for copying the word of God and luxury manuscripts of religious works. Now that you are in possession of all the data, uh, let's move finally to the manuscripts themselves. And the three main works of Ibn Tumart, which we are discussing uh, are the uh, Kitab ibn Tumart or the Azma Yutlab, the most precious object of desire, it represents the oral teachings of ibn Tumart, and uh, as the introductory part explains, it was edited more than 20 years after his death by the Caliph Abd al Mu'min. <coughs> the second work is uh, called uh, Muhadi al Muwatta but also uh, is also known under the name of the Muwatta uh, al-Imam al-Mahdi. It's a commentary and re-edition of uh, the Muwatta of Malik, manipulated in such a way to legitimize the Almohad creed and approach to the Sharia. The title Muhadi al-Muwatta has traditionally been trans uh, translated in, in French as uh, l'offrande du Muwatta, um, incorrectly, I believe, uh, since Muhadi is the active participle of the third form 
of the verb hada uh, yahdu, meaning uh, to stand opposite, and has nothing to do uh, with the fourth form of the verb hada uh, yahdi, which is the one that means uh, to offer. This is why I prefer to translate it as the counterpart of the muwatta, which makes perfect sense in the light of al mohad ideology. Uh, then there is another uh, manuscript uh, we won't talk about today. Um, it's a compendium uh, and commentary on the Sahih uh, Muslim. Now, <coughs> these are the frontispiece and the first page of one of the surviving manuscripts of the Asma Yutlab, copied under the reign of the second Almohad Caliph, uh, Abu Yaqub, in 1183. And the manuscript is now in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France and is the earliest illuminated manuscripts copied on paper to have survived from the Islamic West. And this detail is important, I believe, if considered in the light of the innovative doctrinal stances promoted by the Almohads. Paper had become a perfectly acceptable support for copying important religious works. The style of illumination is 100% Quranic, based on rectangular frames for chapter headings and marginal devices with uh, foliated motifs there. <coughs> Five minutes? How many? Three minutes, right. Um, so you can notice in this uh, manuscript the complete absence of archiving angular script and also uh, the innovative support and the unprecedented polychromy, especially in the red and the blue inks used to highlight particular letters. And this gave uh, these manuscripts a remarkably modern aspect, which must have struck its late 12th century readers. And this is how the Almohad reform was expressed visually. Uh, now let's move to the uh, Kitab al Muwatta. Uh, which is uh, much, less, uh, much less known. And this one is from the National Library in Algiers, was copied for the Caliph Al-Mansur himself, as stated in the frontispiece of the, uh, on the left-hand side of the screen. The entire title is presented on the left, and then you have uh, an incredible long sequence of eulogies and uh, titles praising the Caliph and uh, his kingship. And uh, this uh, important sequence is uh, further emphasized by the use of precious uh, lapis lazuli blue, something that Francisco would have liked. Um, and this is a distinctive feature of Almohad uh, royal manuscripts, and more importantly, by the omnipresence of Maghribi Thuluth script in gold, not only here, but also throughout the manuscripts, uh, in the chapter headings, all painted in gold and vocalized in uh, uh, lapis lazuli blue, and in this absolute uh, ostentatious colophon. Here, praises are lavished on the Mahdi and the well-guided caliphs, al Khulafa al-Rashidin, uh, who are the first uh, three Almohad caliphs, of course, a reference to the, the three caliphs that had uh, followed uh, the Prophet Muhammad. This very distinctive style was employed by the Almohads as a true dynastic brand, not only on manuscripts, but also on coinage, since the reform of Abd al-Mu'min in the 1150s, and on the introductive formula and mottos of the Chancery of Marrakesh. Maghrebi Thuluth replaced almost completely the angular Kufic scripts, not only on coinage, but also in monumentally, uh, monumental, monumental and funerary epigraphy, metalwork and textiles. You see, for instance, the inscribed bands here on the banner, uh, the famous one, once thought to have been used in the battles of Las Navas de Tolosa. In illuminated manuscripts, Maghribi Thuluth appeared wherever calligraphy was required to highlight particularly important passages of the text, that is, wherever standard Andalusi bookends were not deemed sufficiently conspicuous. This is the last manuscript that I'm going to show you. It's probably the most lavish copy of the Muhadi al Muatta uh, from the Karawin Library. Uh, and of course, from uh, the first uh, page spread, you can immediately recognize it as an al Muhad manuscript because of the script, because of the polychromy, because of what we've been talking about. However, 
uh, if we go through uh, the pages of the manuscripts, we will see that most of the chapter headings are written in uh, calligraphic round scripts, Maghrib Thuluth. There are uh, exceptions, and this is particularly remarkable. Some of the surah headings feature um, an angular Kufic script, imitating the ancient Abbasid scripts used for copying the Quran uh, 400 years later. You can see it here. Uh, this may seem in contradiction with what I've just said about the innovative features of uh, these manuscripts. However, I believe uh, that this exception finds a convincing explanation if understood against the background of al mohad ideology. If we observe these chapter headings in more detail, we will notice that the scribe was uh, not simply imitating a vague idea of Kufic script, but he was actually uh, very much convinced of hi uh, what he was doing. He was imitating a special script employed uh, uh, between the 8th and the 9th century. Um, uh, this scribe even vocalized the words according to the ancient system of Abu al-Aswad ad-Duali, based on red dots, and he did so very accurately. Uh, this calligrapher, uh, I'd like to argue, um, had a precise model in mind, namely the celebrated Quran of Uthman, brought from Cordoba to Marrakesh by the Almohad Caliph Abd al-Mu'min in 1157. In the Almohad capital, the Codex of Uthman beca uh, became a key relic and source of legitimacy for the new rulers, who used it in processions, enthronement ceremonies, and the like. And this, is po uh, this important manuscript, the, the Uthmanic Codex, was um, finally lost uh, two centuries later, so we can no longer compare its script with this particular uh, Kufic style. However, as convincingly demonstrated by François de Roche, all the surviving Uthmanic codices in Istanbul, Cairo, Tashkent, and St. Petersburg were copied in the 8th century in a script very similar to this one. And this one is, for instance, the copy that is in nowadays in Cairo. It is therefore tempting, and perhaps not too far-fetched, to see in these calligraphic titles a reference to the Almohad appropriation of the Uthmanic relic, and therefore an attempt to proclaim their direct connection with the origins of Islam. Thank you very much. <laughs>